So, welcome to this talk about uh, escaping from WCF and embracing the brave new world of GRPC, why you'd want to do that, how easy or difficult it's likely to be, and various other bits and pieces. I am Mark Rendell. You may remember me from very stupid talks <laughs> um, and some technical talks that went quite well. Um, but uh, at the moment, so Microsoft, when they announced this last year um, that WCF was going away, um, I somehow got involved and then I ended up writing a book on how to migrate from WCF to GRPC, which you can get on the website, on Microsoft's website. Um, and I've started building a tool to do it as well. Um, it's not a marketing session for the tool. Um, I'm not going to show you it. I'm not going to demonstrate it. All I am going to say is that everything I show you, it will do automatically with two clicks. So just bear that in mind. Um, so here we are at the start of 2020. .NET Core 3.1 is out. That's a long-term service release. Um, and the future of .NET looks like this. So we have .NET Core 3.1, that came out in November 2019. Then version 5 will be out this November. And .NET 5, so it's not .NET Core 4, because that would be too confusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's .NET 5, because everybody understands what that means. It means .NET 4 is dead, and you should stop using it and Microsoft would really, really like it if you stopped using it, because then they could take all the developers that make the patches to do with time zones changing. I think that's the only reason they changed .NET 4 now, is that someone moves a time zone. Um, but yes, .NET 5, it's Mono, it's .NET Core, it's Xamarin, it's the whole stack uh, moving forward. And then once a year, in November every year, we'll get a new .NET release. Um, or that's what Microsoft claim. And so .NET passed. We have things that have been brought across to .NET 5 and .NET 3.1, uh, Core 3.1. Not confusing at all. But we have things that are not being brought across. So WPF and Windows Forms are both in .NET Core 3.1. Um, only if you run it on Windows because Microsoft, but they're there and they work and Microsoft will continue to support those until they convince everyone that the best way to make desktop applications is Blazor and run it in Electron or something. I don't know. So things that are not going into .NET Core and .NET 5, web forms is not making it across. Um, and you're supposed to use Blazor instead. So, has anyone who's going to Blazor talks or has been to a Blazor talk? It looks quite good. At the moment, it's, it looks the server side Blazor thing. I'm just kind of, that can't be right. I thought view state was bad. We're just going to keep an open signal R connection for the yeah. end. Um, but Blazor WebAssembly looks quite exciting. Um, I quite like the idea that. Blazor WebAssembly, they download a WebAssembly version of technically the mono runtime, and then they just download DLLs, like IL DLLs, and they run them in the browser. And so I'm thinking, if that's the mono runtime, then does that include mono's implementation of system.web? And if it does, can we download that into the browser and compile our web forms applications to DLLs and then download the web forms DLLs into the browser and actually run web forms inside Blazor? <laughs> and, and actually, has somebody already done that? And that's what we're all living in. The universe is actually <laughs> just, this is a side effect of someone running web forms in a browser. In a, in a higher existence. Um, so yes, if you've got millions of lines of web forms that you need to port to Blazor, I'm sorry. Um, there's really nothing you can do about that. Uh, WCF is not coming across, and that's what we're going to talk about now, to uh, the 
switching to gRPC, which is Microsoft's recommendation. And then there's Workflow Foundation. Hands up, who used Workflow Foundation? OK. I swear to God, I've done this talk half a dozen times. That's the first time I've seen hands. <laughs> wow. Uh, Workflow Foundation is actually getting an open source port. Um, full disclosure, so is WCF, but WCF's open source port is going to be a lot more challenging for them to implement properly. And by the time you get to things like uh, MSMQ bindings, well, that's going away. Um, and distributed transaction controllers. Good luck getting that working in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, but Workflow Foundation relies less on those things, and so there is an open source port of that. So WCF specifically. WCF had... Um, it was incredibly flexible, and one of the main reasons that .NET development teams adopted WCF back in 2008, 2009, was because everybody was doing SOAP. SOAP over HTTP, because that's the solution to distributed systems engineering. It's to wrap a single digit in two kilobytes of namespace-infested XML <laughs> so that you can send it over the wire to a client that's been generated from yet another big pile of namespace-infested XML and you could do all this just by writing a simple class and about 400 lines of namespace-infested XML. We loved XML back in, the, back in the 2000s, didn't we? Oh, it was the best. But the great thing, if you use WCF with SOAP over HTTP, then it could play nicely with other platforms. It could talk to Java, it could talk to Python. There weren't other platforms apart from those two, I don't think. Um, did Ruby ever do SOAP? Could you write like to, Probably. Um, but yes, if it wanted to interoperate with other systems, then SOAP WCF was very good for that, the basic HTTP binding. And then you had WCF with NetTCP. And NetTCP opened a TCP connection, not an HTTP connection, just a raw socket connection, and you had a .NET application at one end and a .NET application at the other end, and they could talk to each other and have asynchronous conversations, and it was a binary protocol and very, very efficient and incredibly fast, and you could stream things in both directions at the same time. Um, the problem with NetTCP Microsoft very optimistically said, here is the specification for NetTCP. Java people, would you like to implement that in Java so that you could talk to our NetTCP services? And the Java people went, no. Uh, so if you used NetTCP, it was a .NET application talking to a .NET application, at which point you might as well use .NET remoting. So, and of course, the configuration, the, oh. I hated configuring WCF. I absolutely hated it because they didn't have like decent functioning IntelliSense for the XML at the time because that's quite difficult to do. And you couldn't configure it in code. These days, we can do configuration in code and you just have like action callbacks that pass in builder objects and you set properties on them and then it just magically happens. But no. XML, it's XML all the way down. So, now Microsoft are saying, we're not supporting WCF moving forward. WCF is not coming to .NET Core. Get over it and migrate to gRPC. Who makes gRPC? Google. What does the G in gRPC stand for? Apparently anything but Google, according to Google. Uh, <laughs> It stands for glamorous, I think, was, was one. Every time they release a new update to it, they change what the G stands for. It's just never Google. That's why it's a lowercase g, so you know it's not Google. Um, but gRPC essentially is an attempt to solve the same problem that WCF attempted to solve, which is, of course, remote procedure calls. gRPC is based on Protobuf. So Protobuf existed first, and Protobuf is Google's serialization framework and format and specification. Um, and with Protobuf, you create 
a file that describes your data object, and then you use a file, uh, a, a compiler that generates Python or Java or C++ or .NET, or um, you can even, these days, even though it's all still the JVM, you can get different compilers that compile it to Scala or Kotlin or Clojure. Um, but yes, it generates these stubs that mean everything can talk this same language. Um, it's also incredibly small over the network, minimal possible size, um, and very, very fast to serialize and deserialize. So the CPU time involved in decoding and encoding is also very low as well as the um, network latency. And it's really quite simple. Um, it's, it's very straightforward uh, and quite limited um, in some ways, but incredibly powerful in other ways. So then on top of this, they built gRPC. They had an internal project called Stubby, which was their own RPC framework. And Stubby had some very, very hairy C and C++ code in there and they distributed it as a, as a um, linked library. And that could be used by their Python stuff and their Java stuff and their C++ stuff. But it was really very Google specific. Um, if there were ever any problems with it, they just hacked more lines of code into it to fix that problem for that particular user. And it had become unmanageable. And then HTTP2 came along, or rather quick. No, not quick. What was it, Spuddy? Spuddy came along, which was Google's attempt to improve HTTP, and then Spuddy became HTTP2, and everyone adopted it, and that was cool. And then they went, actually, HTTP2 does most of the complicated stuff that Stubby does in terms of framing and duplexing and streaming and everything else. Let's rewrite Stubby over the top of HTTP2, and so they did that and called it gRPC. And it works exactly the same as protobuf. So you, gen you describe your service in a .proto file, and then you use the compiler, and it generates source code in whatever language you ask it to. And then you just implement the services, and it creates clients for other services and everything else. So with gRPC, we get, because it's a binary format, we get the benefits of NetTCP style performance, and because HTTP2 supports uh, multiplexing connections, you're doing a brilliant job there, mate. Sign language for multiplexing. <laughs> um, but yes, and, and uh, bi directional streaming and everything else, so it can do everything that NetTCP can do but it supports more platforms and frameworks and languages than were ever able to talk SOAP. Um, it's, quite a lot of them are officially supported, but then there are unofficial implementations for more uh, cutting edge things like Rust has a gRPC compiler implementation. So you get the benefit of SOAP and interoperability, but without XML, and you get the benefit of NetTCP, but your clients and servers can be all different uh, platforms and languages. Here's a list of everything that gRPC supports. .NET, Java, Python, uh, Dart. So if you're doing Flutter, then you can create a gRPC client for your Flutter application in Dart. Um, Elixir and Erlang separately. Um, and so if you're creating telephone switchboards that need gRPC, you can do that. Um, Haskell, because Haskell programmers haven't got anything real to write, so they just run around looking for projects to do. Um, the one thing, so uh, it supports JavaScript, but only in Node, because it's actually a wrapper around the gRPC um, native library. Uh, it doesn't directly support the web browser because the web browser, the HTTP2 implementation, you don't have enough control over it from JavaScript to do the things that uh, gRPC wants to do with HTTP2. Solution uh, to that was to create a tiny little proxy service that you could run on the same machine or in the same 
local network as your gRPC service that would then expose it as uh, WebSockets, I think, um, and then your browser application could connect to that and talk to that over WebSockets or HTTP, and it would pass proxy the messages on, which is quite cool, and uh, you know, if you really need to be able to talk to it from the browser, then that's a great solution. Um, I literally saw this on Monday as I was finishing off the prep for this talk, um, and uh, James Newton King, who works on the gRPC for ASP.NET Core implementation, they've got an experimental thing uh, which they have released as a NuGet package which does the gRPC web protocol natively inside your ASP.NET Core gRPC application. So you don't need that additional process. So it'll run the gRPC service, but it will also run that proxy in the same process so that your browser applications can connect to it as well. So you don't need that proxy server um, running for your web stuff. Uh, haven't had a chance to play with it yet, but it looks quite cool, and if it does work, it will be brilliant. So, ASP.NET Core gRPC. You've actually been able to do gRPC in .NET for a very long time. Uh, there is an official um, first-party implementation. It's been supported by the Google team that works on gRPC for years. But it is a bunch of p-invoke wrappers over the gRPC native library that's written in C. And that comes with all the uh, overhead of p-invoke and marshalling and everything else that goes on with that sort of thing. Microsoft wanted a fully managed implementation that would play nicely with the rest of the ASP.NET Core uh, hosting model, things like dependency injection and uh, Kestrel and all that sort of stuff. And so they said, hey, let's write our own implementation of gRPC, but because this is 2020's Microsoft and not 2010's Microsoft, they're actually doing it in the gRPC GitHub organization. So this is Microsoft contributing code to gRPC, which makes ASP.NET Core do it. So it's a fully managed implementation, part of the gRPC. It's maintained by Microsoft people, um, including James Newton King, uh, who did JSON.NET. So, you know, he's quite good at the serialization stuff. It runs on the Kestrel HTTP server, which means it is ridiculously fast, like 99.99999% as fast as the fastest web server in the world. Um, and there's also a client generator, uh, and the client side uses HTTP client, which has also got bonkers fast over the last couple of releases of .NET Core. Setting it up in your uh, ASP.NET Core application, it's literally just adding a couple more things to startup. So we say services.addgrpc. Have I done? Yes, I have. Um, services.addgrpc hooks it up um, as long as you've created the application with gRPC uh, libraries referenced. And then in configure, we have endpoints.mapgrpc service portfolio service. That's, that's basically it. That's now hooked up your gRPC service. Um, you can add other endpoints in there. You can have an MVC application or a Razor Pages application or just standard endpoints, um, map get, map put, and that sort of thing in the same application. You shouldn't, but you can. Um, what you'll actually see if you sort of do .NET new gRPC is they say, map the gRPC service and then just put an HTTP get that catches any HTTP request after it that says, this is a gRPC server, stop trying to access it from your browser. Um, so yes, that's, that's basically it. Uh, to create your actual, to say I need this service and it does this thing and this is what my, the stuff that you would have done with service contracts and data contracts and operation contracts and data members and everything else, we now have the .proto file. So we use that to describe our service and then the build process, and this is included in the MS build process, so Visual Studio will just run it in the background. Um, or it'll happen when you 
do the build on uh, your continuous integration server. And then you derive from the generated class and override some methods, and that's where you put your actual implementation. So it's a bit different from WCF. WCF, you created an interface and decorated it with the attributes, and that was in C Sharp. And then you implemented the interface um, using another class or whatever else. Um, and then it would generate the WSDL file for other people who wanted to consume your service, and they could generate their client from that WSDL file. Here, we effectively hand write the WSDL file. That's what the proto file is. It's the description of the service. Don't worry, it's much simpler than WSDL. Has anyone ever handwritten a WSDL file? There's always one. Respect. Um, so yes, you write that file, but it's, it's like code. Um, and then you derive from the class that it generates for you in C Sharp. This is a proto file. Um, this is uh, very, very simple. It's got uh, an option with a C Sharp namespace. You can have all sorts of options in your um, proto file for different platforms. So if somebody else who's not using C Sharp uh, compiles this to Java, then it will just ignore that C Sharp namespace. Um, and if you get a proto file from somebody else, you'll probably see a whole bunch of options related to the code gen for other platforms that you don't care about. Uh, the package name, that's important. That becomes part of the URL for the service. And then you have the service and you have RPCs and an RPC has a name that takes an object and returns another object. And that's basically it. Um, and then you have your message definitions, which look like this. So we have a portfolio message and a portfolio item message. And uh, Protobuf supports a set of data types natively. And it doesn't support any other data types um, natively. But it's quite extensible, and so there are uh, ways of creating more complex types. Um, but int32 is just a 32-bit integer. Uh, there is also uint32 for an unsigned 32-bit integer. And there's sint32 for a signed 32-bit integer. Because, of course, you need int32 is also signed. But if you know that your number is going to have a lot of negative values, then you should use sint32, because the encoding is more efficient if there are, uh, I think, yeah. Um, we have double, uh, we have uh, string, byte arrays. Um, we don't have arrays, we just have the repeated keyword. And that will, in C Sharp, that will generate a collection for you of type portfolio item. And then the other thing you'll notice, oh, my uh, field names are wrong here. I've used camel case. This is from some old code. That should be uh, snake underscore train case, um, according to the gRPC standards. Uh, yes, the last thing is on the end, you see there is a number by each one of those fields. And that is very important. That number identifies that field <laughs> in the binary protocol. So it doesn't put the name in, it puts the number, it actually combines the field number with another number that represents the type into a single um, byte, if it can. Uh, the first 15 fields encode one byte smaller than all the other fields. Um, but that number says, the first field in portfolio, the number one field in portfolio, will always be a 32-bit integer, um, and specifically that type of 32-bit integer, uh, and it will always be used for the ID. If you change your object, then you can add more fields, and you can remove existing fields, but you reserve the number. And this means that no matter how your service evolves, theoretically, it should always be possible for an older version of the client 
to talk to a newer version of the server, and even for a newer version of the server to talk to an older version of the client. So those field numbers are incredibly important and very useful. Um, one more thing, which I know is going to please everybody in the room who cares about money. Protobuf doesn't have a decimal type. It has double. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> now, the thing is, that's actually OK. Because if you turn a decimal into a double, um, it serializes fine. It maintains that value absolutely fine. And if you then turn it back into a decimal at the other end, it's not going to randomly change it. That's not the problem. The problem is where someone pulls down your repeated portfolio item items and then runs a link aggregation over the generated protobuf class, which has got a double in it, and says, what is 5 times 4.99? And of course, as we all know, that's 24.94999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
So gRPC has uh, several modes that it supports, and um, they map fairly well to WCF. And I'm going to show some code examples in a minute um, of uh, first a simple request reply service. So WCF, basic HTTP binding, the sort of thing you would just do SOAP, you pass a request, it returns a response. And that's the simplest gRPC thing. You pass a request, it returns a response. WCF, with certain bindings, if you returned an I enumerable from your uh, operation contract method, it could stream those items. So it would send the first one as soon as it was ready, and then they would stream over one at a time. Worked very well with net TCP binding. Um, didn't work at all with some of the other bindings. gRPC can return a stream uh, from the server, which you can then enumerate over and read the objects off. gRPC can also send, so open a stream to the server and then just send messages up it, which is kind of like uh, WCF, where you've got an operation contract with one-way methods. So it's fire and forget. I don't care. Just do it. Um, don't get back to me. Uh, WCF's most powerful feature, the full duplex. So the client has an interface that it can use to send uh, message calls to the server, and the server has a callback interface that it can use to invoke methods on the client. And so you had a two-way conversation which allowed you to do a lot of very powerful things. Um, gRPC has bi-directional streaming. So you can, the server can return a stream, the client can open a stream to the server, and then they can send messages in both directions completely independently of each other. And then you can write some funky code that will effectively make that work like full duplex, which I will show you shortly. If you were using WCF with a binding to MSMQ, then just write the code to write it to the queue. And um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> or write a GRP, gRPC service to write it to the queue, and then use, uh, uh, yeah. Um, but that's MSMQ, uh, particular software. Apparently, MSMQ is dead, according to their blog. So don't use that anymore. So um, basic binding looks like this. Um, so here we have a WCF, or what used to be a WCF service contract. It's a hotel service. Um, it's got a method get available rooms, which takes a date time offset of a check-in date and a date time offset for the check-out date, and returns a list of rooms. Uh, we also have a simple method where you specify the room number, and it just returns that room. Uh, we have a more complicated one where you specify a list of numbers and it returns the matching list of rooms. And then finally, we have a streaming method where you just say, just get me all the rooms. But bearing in mind that that could be those big Hilton hotels just over the river, that's a lot of rooms. So don't build a massive list on the server and send it over all at once. The implementation for that we just implement that interface, and we've got our um, data repository, and we're just going to return a list here, and we're going to return a room there. Um, and all rooms is returning an I enumerable. So that's a very thin wrapper around effectively a repository class. <laughs> and our room object here, um, room has a number. It's on a floor. It's got a name, just in case it's called like the Lincoln suite or something. Um, and it's got a price, which is a decimal. So to represent this in a protobuf file, um, our hotel service looks very similar. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Can everyone see that all right? At the back, just about? Good. Um, so yeah, our hotel service, effectively this becomes our... Uh, service contract interface. So we're saying it has these methods, they take these request types and they return these response types. So we've wrapped the parameters for each of those methods in a gRPC, uh, in a protobuf message. Um, and I've just named those 
after the uh, method that they apply to. So get available rooms has a get available rooms request and returns a get available rooms response. Um, now you might be tempted at this point to say, I'm going to create a reusable message that can be shared by multiple services um, called rooms list, which has just got a repeated rooms field in, or room field inside it. Uh, it's generally a better idea to do it this way. So for the wrapper message around your request and your response, create it separately for each method so that if one of them needs to add a field to its parameters or add a field to its response, you're not going to break all the others. So you're future-proofing your application this way by duplicating a little bit of code. And, you know, it's copy and paste. We're programmers. We're good at that. <laughs> if you've got the Vim plugin, it's yank and paste. So, yeah. Now, another type that Protobuf does not have is a date or a date time. Um, or a date time offset. Uh, what it does have is something called a well-known type. And as soon as you try and build anything real in gRPC, you will start needing to use the well-known types. This is a library of protobuf definitions that are part of the core system. It's like the standard library for protobuf. But they are defined in protobuf and you can generate the code for them the same way you can generate the code for your own proto file. Um, Datetime offset and date time both map nicely to timestamp. Timestamp does actually include time zone information. So it's strictly, it's more like date time offset than date time. Um, so we import google slash protobuf slash timestamp dot proto and then down here we use the message type, uh, the field type, google.protobuf.timestamp. There is a standard for this, so the path to the import, that doesn't actually exist anywhere on disk. The compiler just knows about it. It's built into the compiler. Um, but the name of the type is always the path with the slashes replaced with dots and then Pascal case on the thing at the end. So slash protobuf slash timestamp becomes dot protobuf dot timestamp. And here, I've actually got my proper case on the fields. Um, and we have a get room request and a get rooms request. And we have an all rooms request. Doesn't take any parameters, so I just declare an empty object. If later on I decide I want to add a parameter to all rooms, then I can and I don't break any existing clients. You still have to write code for these, by the way. You have to sort of say, if that field's not set, then do something sensible. You can't just add a field and then assume that it will always be set. It might not be. Um, but that is just, again, that's just programming. Um, we have a repeated room values in the get available rooms response. Um, and our room down here, we've got a double for the price. And uh, finally, all rooms. So all rooms, which was the one that returned an I enumerable of room, is now in its return section saying, I return a stream of all rooms response. And that says, this will open a stream, and it will write objects until there are no more objects, and then it will close that stream again. There are multiple reasons why you might want to use a stream rather. So. <clears throat> If you've got 10 rooms and each one is like uh, 50 bytes worth of data, then don't return a string because it's much quicker to just build that list in memory, encode that list in one go, and fire it back as a single response. But if you've got 1,000 rooms and each one is 500 bytes in memory and you don't want to use 500K of memory building, an in, uh, building the response, then you can use a stream and send them one at a time. Equally, if you've just got a bunch of objects and they take a long time to calculate, they take a long time to construct from whatever sources, and you want the first one, the client can start using the first one while you're still working on the others, then you can use a stream to 
give more responsiveness for your user. Um, and finally, maybe you've just got a notification service. Maybe you've just got sort of incoming messages or a weather service or something, and you just want to infrequently send updates. And so you can do that using a stream as well. So um, then we have our room conversion. So this solution was converted from uh, a .NET 4.7.2 WCF solution. And that solution um, had this room class in it, which was a data contract, and it had data members, um, which have now been commented out. Um, so this conversion class has been generated, and that's gone into the Protos folder as well. Um, so the Protos folder is where, by convention, you put your Proto files. You don't have to. You can put them anywhere you want, but that's <coughs> where the boilerplate puts it for you. Um, the Proto file has said, use hotelcore.protos as the namespace. And all the classes that gRPC generates for you are partial, which means you can uh, add functionality to them. Uh, and in this case, I've added implicit operators to convert between the protobuf room message and the old uh, room data contract type. And you can see here that it just uh, sets the fields and calls convert dot to double on the price and convert dot to decimal um, on that price there. Um, and then finally, the uh, service code itself. So this is my implementation code here. Um, this is where it implements the uh, methods from the proto file, from the service in the proto file. Um, and we inject, basically I've just copied the old service contract implementation over from the WCF application. Um, and I inject that into my gRPC service. And then for each one of those requests, I just call the equivalent service contract request, um, converting check-in date, which is a protobuf timestamp, to the date time offset. Um, and then I create a new get available rooms response, write the values into response.values. And then because the original code here was synchronous, as a lot of WCF code is, um, I just return a task from result on there. Um, similar thing with get room response and get rooms response, just pulling numbers out and into arrays. But essentially all I'm doing here is mapping from the gRPC request and response messages and the gRPC methods to the old service contract method. So if you've got code that basically will work in .NET Core, so you're not using any um, NuGet packages for which there is not an updated version that works with .NET Core, and you're not using uh, horrible things that are built into the .NET framework that nobody even knew about, um, or you know, if you are, you can get rid of them, then you should be able to rescue most of your existing code and just wrap this gRPC facade around it and carry on using it. It should, theoretically, be fairly low effort. Um, and you can see here we have our all rooms. So when you specify streaming for a RPC method, um, you don't create the stream. The gRPC runtime creates the stream for you and just goes, here you are, here's the stream, write to it. And so you do that um, and then uh, we say, for each item in get the rooms, um, create a new all rooms response, and then write that response to the stream. And then the other thing that we really want to do, no, that, that's fine. Um, this is a bit weird because um, <clears throat> this method returns a task. When that task completes, the stream will be closed. Um, and the connection will be closed and the client will, will finish. 
And so you have to keep it inside this method. You have to sort of do an async call. You can do all the async calls you can think of, but don't just start something running on a background thread and pass the stream to it and then return a completed task because that will cause gRPC to go, and we're done. And if you're anything like me, you'll spend several hours trying to work out why that happened. Task.run does not do what you think it does. So, so that's a duplex service. Uh, that's not a duplex service. That's a very simple service. Um, and yeah, effectively, it's just taking your old boilerplate code and wrapping it in some new boilerplate code. And then over time, you can kind of refactor it and make it a little bit more uh, native to gRPC and maybe sort of pull things out of service contracts and everything else. But you can um, achieve this without having to rewrite everything from scratch, I think is my point. Um, if you can drag your c -sharp files into a .NET Core 3.1 project and that .NET Core 3.1 project builds, then you can probably carry on using them. The only thing you will definitely, definitely need to remove, data contract and data member will actually work. Those are still there. Um, but uh, service contract, operation contract, fault contract, all the things that were in system.service model, those are gone. So comment those out. You'll probably be fine. OK. So that was. Uh, request response basic binding. Obviously, that's quite straightforward. Trying to make duplex work is a little bit more complicated. Um, oh, we also saw server streaming there. By the way, that all rooms method where it used to return an I enumerable and now it just returns a server stream. But bidirectional streaming as a way of doing full duplex is much more fun. And the other thing that this kind of highlights is that WCF had this concept of session. And you had instance context mode. And you could basically say, when the client opens the connection, start a session, create an instance of the service contract class, and keep it alive until the client is finished. And so if you set any fields um, or stored any data, in private fields or properties inside that class, that effectively was your session state. So no load balancing at all, um, but it did make it very, very easy to have a continuous conversation going. And as we'll see from Microsoft's calculator example, because why wouldn't you implement a calculator as a full duplex WCF service that requires NetTCP binding to work? So we have our, um, our IE calculator interface. This would have been our um, service contract interface in our old code. Um, this is taken directly from Microsoft's WCF samples. So we have add to, subtract from, multiply by, divide by, all of which take a double um, and a clear. And all of these methods, return void. Um, so no value goes back from these methods. Any values that go back to the client are going to come uh, through the callback interface. And our callback interface looks like this. So we have a result. I've added a result async just to make my life a bit easier. Um, and an equation and an equation async. And so anytime the server wants to communicate data back to the client, it does it by invoking a method. Now, WCF did some really hairy stuff. It basically used runtime reflection and IL emit to generate an in-memory representation of that callback class that marshaled method calls to NetTCP sockets and everything else. Um, we're not going to do that now. Instead, we are going to abuse or use um, bidirectional streaming. So our service now, it doesn't have all those methods. It doesn't have an add and a subtract and everything else. It just has a start, and it creates a client stream 
of actions and returns another stream of callbacks. And so our calculator action message here has a message type. You can nest messages inside other messages, um, which is a really good way of making sure you don't get clashes between type names. Um, and so our calculator action has nested message types for clear and add to and subtract from. Um, and then it uses a one of. So one of is a protobuf keyword and it says, here is a uh, subset of fields within these braces. Only one of these can be set. Um, and if you set one of them, and then set another one, the first one that you set won't be set anymore. And so this calculator action will either have a clear or an add to or a subtract from, and you'll be able to tell which one it is. So this is effectively like a variant type or a union type. It's saying this message will be one of these things. And the callback, same thing. We have a result callback and an equation callback and another one of field in there. Um, and then we have our calculator um, implementation here. So this is matches the service contract implementation. So we have our add to um, and our subtract from and everything else. Um, and we have a callback type, which works just like our uh, callback would have worked in WCF with full duplex binding, except instead of operation context dot current dot get callback contract angle brackets, the type of the callback contract, we're just going to create it ourselves and pass it in. Um, and then our uh, service, and this is the point where it gets really fun, is we have our start method here. And that gives us the request stream, which is the requests coming in from the client, and the response stream, which is the way that we can write responses to the client, and our server call context, as before. And then, <clears throat> because this is .NET Core 3.1, and we're doing C Sharp 8, we've got async enumerable. And so request stream um, is an iAsync stream reader, but there's an extension method on that that turns it into an iAsync enumerable of those requests, and so we can just do an await for each. Then we can have a switch statement, and that action, as well as having the fields for things like clear and add to, um, it generates an action case enumeration and a field of that type, and that tells you which one of the fields is set. So we can very quickly switch over that, and we can say, if it's a clear message, then invoke the clear method. If it's an add to message, invoke the add to method. If it's a subtract from message, invoke subtract from. And then down here, uh, you can see that invoke add to async, it passes in that action and it just calls that on the contract. Contract was passed in up at the top here, um, or as a factory to create it. And then the client code for that, because it's no fun having this. So we have a uh, program.cs here, and we have a calculator client adapter. So it's all very well you on your team, on your server side, saying, hey, we've created a gRPC version of this, and all you have to do is instead of implementing a callback interface, you have to subscribe to a stream of callback messages and decide what you're going to do according to the type of the message and whether that's a result callback or an equation callback. And so to be helpful to our users and also to remove barriers to adoption, we're going to create a library that contains a wrapper around the gRPC client that is compatible, source code compatible, with their old generated WCF client, because we're nice like that. And that essentially just does the same thing, um, but at the other end. So we need to make sure it's started, obviously. Um, and then 
we have a callback task, which we're going to run asynchronously over the response stream. Um, you can see here that this is just uh, essentially when you call the method on this class, it makes sure the stream has been started and then it wraps that up in the right kind of action. So it's creating a new add to there and then writes that to the request stream. And if we scroll down here far enough, we've got the run callback and that looks very similar to the server side thing. So you'll just for each await or await for reaching over that stream of callback messages and then passing those through to the callback implementation that was how they used to get these things back in the WCF days. It's complicated, isn't it? <laughs> but it does work. Um, and really, once you know those patterns, it's quite possible. It's, it's so sort of repeatable that um, you can make a Visual Studio plugin that does it. Um, but please don't. I don't like competition. Um, so yes, but this effectively, this still gives you a way of wrapping around um, your existing code and just wrapping it in a new uh, way of handling this. And of course, the advantage is that once you've done this, if you had a service that only worked with NetTCP, um, so your Java users or other people couldn't use it. If you rewrite it using this way of doing bi-directional streaming and firing things backwards and forwards, then you can go to the Python people and say, yes, you can generate a Python client or you can generate a Java client and everybody can be happy and, uh, and work together and hippy-dippy sort of stuff like that. Um, the other thing that this achieves, because our... Um, where's my... server calculator service class gone here. So remember the thing about when you're streaming, in either direction, the stream stays open until that method's... Uh, the task that that method returns completes. So if that... Um, method has to stay open and that method is running inside of this class, which it is because it's using uh, members of this class, then that's going to keep this instance of the class alive for as long as the uh, method is running for, for as long as the stream is open, which means in gRPC, in a very hacky bad way, we have managed to implement session in exactly the same way that WCF used to do it. And so if you, every time somebody calls start, create an instance of your service contract class, then you have instance per session handling the same way that you used to in WCF, um, which I think is quite nice. Very, very hacky, but quite nice. All the code that I'm showing here will be pushed up to GitHub and available for you to download as a reference. Um, so, yeah. Um, security. WCF security was all kinds of fun. How long have I got left? Two minutes, that's fine. Um, but yes, so w in WCF, security was all WS security, and it applied to things like, how are we going to do encryption? Are we going to do message level encryption or value level encryption? And also, how are we going to authenticate the user and authorize the user? And there were lots of different ways of doing this. It integrated with Active Directory and LDAP and Kerberos and God knows what else. Um, basically, gRPC, how is the data going to be encrypted? Well, this is HTTP2. It's encrypted because it's over TLS. You can do it. You can force it to turn TLS off, which is quite handy when you're running in like a Kubernetes cluster and the network's encrypted anyway, so why do it twice? Um, but for public services, they're running over HTTP2. That basically includes TLS, so all communications are encrypted by default. And as far as authentication and authorization goes, it supports certificate authentication, so the client can supply a certificate and the server can validate that certificate. The server, the client, can also validate the server's certificate, 
And so you can make sure that both those certificates were generated by the same authority, which is quite handy for internal systems. Um, and the other thing, it supports for at the call level, so the certificate authentication is handled at the connection level. So when the connection is opened, the certificates are validated and we go, okay, so this is a valid client talking to a valid server. If you then want to do call level authentication, you basically use a token, um, a JSON web token, some kind of bearer token. If you have been using Active Directory, Windows, NTLM, LDAP, Kerberos authentication for your WCF service, then uh, you need to hook up one of those things that generates a bearer token from your Active Directory, so ADFS or something similar, and then you can pass that through into your um, gRPC service, and because Microsoft have got libraries for understanding ADFS tokens, you can still use them as the authentication on the server side, because the server authentication is just ASP.NET Core authentication. It works with the same providers, you use JWT token auth, or um, OAuth, or Okta, or whatever you want to use. Um, in production, this is the really nice thing. So if you get a WCF service that used to run on Windows 2016 um, on a server with uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM and a four core or an eight core Xeon processor and could manage, you know, a thousand requests a second, you can now run that same service as a .NET Core gRPC service on a Raspberry Pi, and it will be able to do 10,000 requests a second. Um, so you can run, the one thing you can't do with an ASP.NET Core 3.1 gRPC service is run it in IIS. You can run it natively on Windows, you can run it behind Nginx, you can run it behind a web server proxy, you can do authentication at that proxy. You can't run it in IIS because IIS doesn't implement all of HTTP2's optional specifically response trailers. This is a matter of waiting for IIS to catch up and possibly by the end of this year you will be able to do that. But you can run it in a Docker container, you can run it in a Kubernetes pod, um, it will play nicely with service meshes if you've got a big production Kubernetes environment or AKS or EKS or Google Cloud or whatever else you might have. Um, this has been a fairly high level talk and I've kind of said, hey, these things are possible. Um, there's a lot more detail in this book that I wrote um, and my wife helped uh, for Microsoft, which is on their um, docs website. If you just Google gRPC for WCF developers, it's search engine optimized its way to the top. If you bing for it, it's on like the third page, so don't do that. Um, <laughs> Why would you do that? Oh, I know, because Microsoft's added a plugin to Chrome that does it for you. Um, the, both the code samples that I've shown here were generated by Visual Recode, um, which is, Preview 3 is gonna be out next week, which does the duplex stuff. Um, it is a commercial product, but it will do an awful lot of this legwork for you, um, and I'm really hoping it is going to be uh, an option for people to rescue huge great swathes of code without having to manually plow through and do everything. Gibraltar Software are going to be selling that, I'm just making it. Um, that's what it does, so version 1 will just do WCF to gRPC, 1.5 will also do WCF REST if anyone's been using that, just turn that into an ASP.NET Core MVC project, and then 2.0 we're going to look at Web API. And then maybe at some point in the future, I'll do that thing with Blazor and Mono and System.Web and just really upset Microsoft. That's it. Um, I've used all the time. Thank you very much for coming. I hope that was useful. I'm around for the rest of the conference, and I've got a two-hour workshop on gRPC where I won't be mentioning WCF, but I will be showing you a lot more detail about creating gRPC applications from scratch. Thank you very much. <laughs>